Hey guys, welcome back. We're going to start talking about the temperance movement. Uh, again, we are in America 1828 to 1850, and we are on slide 32 if you're going along with me. Let me go ahead and pop these up so you can see what it is that you're working on. There you go. During the 1830s and 1840s, many people became active in the temperance movement. Advocates of temperance argued that alcohol consumption had to be curtailed or banned altogether in order to ensure the stability of the family and civil society. Women maintained a particular interest in the subject since they had been the traditional guardians of so-called family virtues. Though men found and led the temperance organizations, they founded it, uh, women increasingly played active roles in spreading the message as the centuries continued. The American Temperance Society, you should write that down, formed in 1826, established numerous chapters. Uh, these, particularly in the North, perhaps because of the Association of Temperance and Anti-Slavery Movements. <laughs> the Temperance Movement had very close ties to this Second Great Awakening that we talked about. Many Protestant churches took up the cause of temperance during the 1830s and 1840s, promoting it as a central component of their crusade towards improving morality in the country. This religious enthusiasm helped spread the temperance message to places it might otherwise not have reached. So by the end of the 1830s, activism had put nearly 20 temperance journals in circulation. So think of maybe uh, the way you think of magazines that are going out. These people had close to 1.5 million members of the temperance movement, which is to get rid of alcohol, stop drinking completely. Uh, if you look at the picture right here, here's a, a, a picture of women out protesting in front of a liquor store. Now, that also led to some more interesting fact because once these women started protesting, they noticed that they did not have certain rights in order to push agendas. So through the 19th century, women could not vote in local, state, or national elections. They had no rights for voting. Early in the century, women remained subject to the ideals of the cult of true womanhood, which held a woman's duty is to her husband, her children, and her home, and to be her divinely ordained calling. She really was sectioned off and said this is all she was supposed to do, and she's supposed to do that well. Uh, the societal norm held that women had no place in politics, not even in the ability to vote. So this view regarding women's roles began to change during the mid-19th century. Corresponding to the Second Great Awakening, again, an establishment of women's activist groups related to temperance and abolition. So by meeting to talk about these issues, women began to talk together and say, well, we want to get rid of slavery, we want to get rid of drinking, wait, shouldn't we be able to vote? if we want to make these decisions. Um, Seneca Falls. We're going to talk about what happens when you get a whole bunch of women together that want to make a decision. Something happens. The women's rights movement, it, it began in its earliest uh, form where we really see it developing out in Seneca Falls Convention. So this is something you've got to know. Write down Seneca Falls Convention of 1848. This is a note you need to take. There are about 300 women and men in Seneca Falls, New York, uh, they established what they called the Declaration of Sentiments. It was modeled after the, after the Declaration of Independence. So everyone knew the Declaration of Independence. It's what made us a collective kind of in the United States. The first line of the second paragraph reads, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men and women are created equal. You catch that? The Declaration of Sentiments also cataloged a number of grievances against men and male society, including the statement that he has never permitted her to exercise her inalienable right to the elective franchise. The document directly called for universal women's suffrage in the United States, stating this. They said, Now in view of this entire disfranchisement of one half of the people of this country, their social and religious degradation in view of the unjust laws above mentioned and because women do feel themselves ag aggrieved, oppressed, and fraudulently deprived of their most sacred rights, we insist that they have immediate admission to all the rights and privileges which belong to them as citizens of the United States. Basically, they said, we deserve to have it right now. This document, of course, sparked heated controversy among almost everybody. Okay. Those who 
generally supported women's rights, uh, even saw this as a, a topic of debate. Many saw its support of women's suffrage as too radical and feared that it would hinder the women's rights movement in other areas, uh, such as the right to own property. Uh, the, the women wanted property rights, they wanted all these rights, and they thought, well, if we just ask for too much, they're not going to give you anything. But of the 300 people present at the convention, 100 of them signed the Declaration of Sentiments, 68 were women, 32 of them were men. The women's suffrage movement pressed on until the ratification of the 19th Amendment to the Constitution in 1920, granting women throughout the country the right to vote. This is a must. You must know that the 19th Amendment in 1920 gave women the right to vote. So write that down, take a minute to look at it, and then we're going to move on to the next slide. Ah, this is important. Uh, you know it because you experience it. Public education. Um, several of the founding fathers, when we think of uh, Thomas Jefferson, uh, they had a, a huge interest in the public education system. Uh, they wanted all children to be able to become educated, and in the mid-19th century, American children received their education in private schools or at home with personal tutors. Religious institutions or charities also ran schools, but without any organized school system or public financing of education, this was very hard. Public schools did exist in the early 19th century, but they lacked financial resources, adequate facilities, and also trained teachers. They, they Even when they held class, they only held it a couple days a week. They didn't hold it all week long. The modern system of public financed education originated in the mid-19th century. Reformers who wanted to make education accessible to all American children, including immigrants and the poor, that was a new thing, okay, gotta think about that. Immigrants and poor people, people who had no money, people who had just moved to this country. The best known of these reformers was Massachusetts lawyer and state senator Horace Mann, who he established uh, and became the secretary of Massachusetts Board of Education in 1837, and in this role, Mann conducted detailed surveys of existing schools and reported widely on his findings. Uh, what he did is he helped to train teachers by creating school norms, okay? uh, helped make, make it a professional occupation. So a teacher became a real thing. It wasn't just someone worked and they also taught. Okay? All right, there's a couple other things here we want to talk about. Public schools themselves, oh, didn't quite mean to go back. There we go. So public schools and the education in the mid-19th century, resolved, uh, it revolved around uh, drilling and reciting. Okay, that was it. They would recite words, they would recite certain um, books, passages, uh, even scriptures, uh, they would also take to drilling. So rather than understanding mathematics, you might work on your time table over and over and over again, multiplications. You might do addition over and over, subtraction over and over again, and help to memorize those things. Not to say it's not important to do those, okay? Because it is important to drill on certain things. But when the entire school is based on only drilling on those things, you don't understand concepts. It doesn't make you think more. They were usually set up to have one single schoolhouse where you had all ages. The, they, were, they were also taught a lot on morals and manners, as well as academics, and corporal punishment. Now, when I say corporal punishment, I don't just mean that they were spanked for disobeying. They were humiliated, quite often, forced to sit in certain places, um, be mocked by their teacher or their students in order to encourage them to be more uh, more productive or be a, a more moral center of society. So write some of these notes down. Really what you want to know is the school went from single building, single house, to a system where we were able to break down and uh, Horace Mann actually used a system he got from the Prussians which is interesting if you think of history. We, uh, we got military from the Prussians during the American Revolution. We got the idea of how to set up our schools from the Prussians. So there was a lot that came out of Europe at that time and influenced who we are today. All right, guys, transcendentalism. What you need to know are these two guys, Ralph Waldo Emerson and Henry David Thoreau. Okay, look at this guy. 
You, you ever had one of those days where you take a picture of yourself and you think, ooh, that's a picture I never want anyone to see? Well, that's what happened to Henry David Thoreau. He had his chin beard day, and that is what he is known as. Every time I hear his name or see his name, that is the picture that pops in my head, and it hopefully will for you for the rest of your life as well. He is known for this, trains in dentalism. So in the late 1820s, this philosophy came out. It, it had a strong tie with the Unitarian branch of Christianity, and we're going to talk about that a little more. Unitarians and transcendentalists placed very high value on these things. Uh, reason, individual freedom, responsibility. They, they didn't put as much emphasis on religious dogma or strict adherence to authoritarian rules. Transcendentalists split from Unitarians, however, in their belief that one institution or spiritual essence could yield a kind of knowledge that transcended what one's physical senses could provide. Despite its religious roots, Transcendentalism became a more general philosophy that could be found in literature, philosophy, and culture. Famous Transcendentalists include these guys, so Ralph Waldo Emerson and Henry David Thoreau. Thoreau is best known for his year-long experiment of living at Waldo Pond, from which he wrote his reflections on society and nature. He kind of sectioned himself off from everybody and tried to become enlightened and write about that experience. Uh, if you want some fun literature, uh, look up some of his work. It's very interesting. Let's talk about utopia. Okay. Uh, first off, the word utopia, you've probably heard it before. A utopian society is one where everything is perfect. Um, in response to economic upheavals, such as the Panic of 1837, remember where we had a, everyone rushing on the banks, we had a loss of income, a lot of loss of jobs, uh, and a culture of increasing commercial commercialism and naked capitalism, basically capitalism across the board where there were no regulations whatsoever, and having a desire to live by religious and philosophical tenets. Some people in the mid-19th century found themselves drawn to the idea of living communally with people who shared their values. So a number of utopian communities aimed at forming the ideal society, the ideal political system, and the ideal economic system emerged during these mid-19th century uh, uh, villages and towns and cities. This overall trend is sometimes called the Utopian Socialist Movement, although utopian communities varied considerably in their goals and their values. In most utopian communities, members shared equally in the community's wealth and possessions rather than individual accumulation of their own money and belongings. That's a general. They all shared their money. Um, if one person got sick, everyone would throw money together to help someone else. Sounds like a great idea in the beginning. The members generally worked in areas in which the community needed help, but they also suited their own individual interests. Um, in many utopian communities, arts and culture became integral to daily life, and people had enough time to enjoy these benefits. What you got to know about these communities, though, is they work perfectly and function great when everyone in the community is willing to work together for the same goal. If one person decides to start hoarding their money or not sharing it, then you have a breakdown. So let's talk about this guy, George Ripley and his wife, uh, Sonia. They founded Brook Farm in Massachusetts. It was a utopian community based on transcendentalist principles. Each member performed an equal share of work in exchange for an equal share of the community's wealth. Every adult had to work 10 hours a day in the summer and 8 hours a day in the winter, and women received the same pay as men. Now that's pretty cool. I mean, think about it. At a time where women started to lose their rights or were fighting for their rights, here, they had the rights that men did. They got the same pay. The community sold produce and handmade products to the public and also earned money from its acclaimed school, which attracted students from outside the community. The same, same thing as we were talking about earlier. Public schools weren't real big at this time, so people were sending their kids in. Brick Farm remained constantly in debt until it's, it was disbanded in 1847, however. So these schools you write down Brook Farm Transcendentalism. That's what you need to know. Okay. The Oneida community was founded on the philosophy of perfectionism. Okay. A lot of you guys try to hold your teachers to this standard, perfectionism. A belief that the perfection could occur on earth, not only in heaven. This Christian socialist community in central New York State denounced private property and declared all adult members to be married to all the other adult members of the opposite sex a system called complex marriage. 
yeah, as if marriage wasn't complex enough. Let's make it more complex. The Oneida community made money from its large farm and by producing steel traps, cutlery, eating utensils. While economically successful, the Oneida community, un their unconventional marriage and family arrangements led to internal dissent. The community eventually transformed into a successful manufacturer of cutlery and silver production. And that was about it. You could understand the issues if everyone's wife was everyone's wife and everyone else's husband was everyone else's husband. At a time where genetics, you couldn't know whose child belonged to whom, there, there could be some major problems there. I'm not going to go into detail. I'm sure you can use your imagination to come up with your own details. These are your discussion questions. Take a moment to read over them. There's a chance that they will end up on your next assessment. All right, acquiring new lands. Here we go. Throughout the period of 1828 to 1850, the United States acquired new territories and settlers moved west into these areas. Several territories became states during this time period as well. So Arkansas in 1836, Michigan in 1837, Florida in 1845, Texas, in 1845, Iowa in 1846, Wisconsin in 1848, California in 1850. In addition, the U.S. signed treaties with Britain and Mexico to confirm the country's boundaries. These treaties included, so write these three treaties down, you have to know these. The Weber, uh, sorry, Webster um, Ashburn Treaty in 1842, which set the eastern boundary between the United States and Canada, including those in the Great Lakes region. The Oregon Treaty in 1846 which ended the dispute between the U.S. and Britain over Oregon country, also helped to keep out Russia from the land, and the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in 1848, in which Mexico gave the land that would become the state of California, Nevada, Utah, parts of Wyoming, Colorado, Arizona, and New Mexico to the United States. The U.S. then divided this land into the Utah Territory, New Mexico Territory, and in 1850, the state of California. A small amount of land south of New Mexico Territory remained in dispute between the United States and uh, Mexico, which later became the guest and purchase. We, we'll work on that. But you need to know these different treaties and what they were about. Oregon Trail. Now, you've all played this, you've all understood the Oregon Trail, but I want you to take a look at the map and really get an idea of the distance. So early in the 19th century, explorations uh, they generated interest in what today is the Pacific Northwest. The Oregon Trail developed as a route by which settlers could reach this fertile region, all this idea of great, wonderful land getting out of the cities and having place to yourself. This trail headed northwest from Independence, Missouri, you need to know that, into the region of present-day Oregon. Beginning in the early 1840s, thousands of people crowded the Oregon Trail with their covered wagons, taking about six months to arrive in the Oregon country. The people on these wagon trains faced the dangers of Native American attacks, diseases, inclement weather, food and water shortage, shortages, and encounters with wild animals. Don't forget, dysentery. Despite these real dangers, settlers often um, they exaggerated the risk of confrontation with Native Americans. Relations between the groups were often peaceful. Settlers traded with the Native Americans for various items, sometimes relied on their Native American neighbors to teach them about the land. Quite often, they used Native Americans as guides to get across certain areas. Traders set up stations to cater to these travelers. Many of these stations developed into military forts, small towns. So uh, Fort Kearney, Nebraska, for example, became the first military fort designed specifically to help and protect people as they moved westward. The popularity of travel to Oregon country strengthened U.S.'s claim to this region over Britain's. So the United States ultimately organized the Oregon Territory in 1848. You've got to know that in order to, even though the British were claiming this territory, the United States was claiming this territory, it doesn't matter who claims it. It's whoever can occupy it and protect it. The United States was one of the first to do that. We have this idea now that we've run into manifest destiny. It was coined in the 1840s. It was a true belief that God had destined the United States, had really chosen the United States to move all the way to the Pacific Ocean. All right. It was coined by a man named John O'Sullivan in 1845. Okay. And you need to write this down. John O'Sullivan, 1845. He said, the United States needs to go all the way to the Pacific Ocean. 
Um, this I did justified westward expansion. It didn't matter that there were Native Americans there. It didn't matter that there might have been other countries or hardships. It was a drive by God. It was a religious movement, and that is why it was acceptable. Uh, it would require the subjugation of Native Americans and taming of the landscape. So write that down. The taming of the western landscape so the settlers could grow crops and continue the lifestyle which they had become accustomed to in the west. It may not be a big deal, but yes, they had to clear forests and set up fields so that they could grow, grow the crops that they were already living on. All right, let's go to this guy. Now, there's some interesting things about James K. Polk, but the big one is if you live in Texas, you kind of have mixed feelings about him. He was a Den uh, Tennessee Democrat, and he served as president from 1845 to 1849. If you notice 1845, something interesting happened close to that time. We already talked about it. The United States realized its largest territorial expansion during this period, so it really began to grow and expand. Polk's presidency coincided with the era sometimes called the Fabulous Forty, a time of increasing prosperity in the nation that included California Gold Rush and the peak of the Oregon Trail immigration. So write that down. Fabulous Forty gave you the Gold Rush and the Oregon Trail. Beginning in 1825, Polk served seven terms in the House of Representatives, including serving as Speaker of the House. He won the governorship of Tennessee, but lost his re-election in 1843. Polk decided, hey, I'll run for president, 1844. He was a Democratic nomination um, over Martin Van Buren. We talked about him already. Uh, so Van Buren opposed annexing Texas. Remember, Texans weren't really happy with that because he was afraid there would be war with Mexico. So, believe it or not, Van Buren was right. Polk argued, and he said that Texas already belonged to the United States, appealing to the country's increasing sense of manifest destiny and desire for great territorial gain. Polk won the Democratic nomination and competed with the Whig candidate, Henry Clay, as a platform of 50-40, 40 year fight. So write that down, 50-40, I'm sorry, 54, 40 year fight. This was referring to the latitude of the northernmost U.S. claim. It was making a campaign promise to fight the British for Oregon Territory as well as annex Texas. Although extremely well known, Clay lost the election by approximately 40,000 votes during his presidency. Polk, uh, he presided over the Mexican-American War, so put that down. He annexed Texas, then presided over the Mexican-American War, which led to an even greater acquisition of land for the United States. He extended President James Monroe's the Monroe Doctrine with his own Polk Doctrine. Now, we haven't talked a whole lot about this, but write down the Polk Doctrine right under Monroe Doctrine. Kind of as if the Monroe Doctrine is giving birth to the Polk Doctrine. However you want to draw that on your paper, have fun. Uh, so this was declaring that no European nations could make any further claim to North America. With the help of Congress, he also reduced tariffs and established an independent treasury system to manage the federal government's money separately from private and state banks. Remember, now we're looking at a change. If you remember back to some of our previous discussions, we went from Alexander Hamilton, we went from a, a bank in the United States to getting rid of the bank in the United States, and then going back now to a, a, a treasury system. Kind of getting out of the, the independent private banks and the state banks. Polk seemed to care little for such social problems as poverty and poor working conditions in factories. He supported the rights of slave owners, making him very unpopular in the North. Which also, if you think about it, you can associate James K. Polk with the increase of Texas uh, becoming part of the United States, because Texas was a slave state at that time. All right, that's all we have for now. When we come back, we're going to talk about the controversies with Oregon.